In our last video, we began looking at animation. We had gotten to the point where we have an animation timer. We have some handlers for keyboard and mouse. But right now, all the animation timer does is it draws stuff for us. We need to animate both the player and the things that we can lay down. And we can remind ourselves what this looks like. We have a text field up here. If I click, I get these what we call chasers. But I can't move the player, which is this partially obscured little green box up in the corner. So there are two main things we need to animate. We need to animate the player based upon the key presses, and we need to animate the uh, chasers. The easiest place to start is with the player. So we can say if up is pressed, well, then we need to alter the location of box. And since it's a VEC2D, we can add another VEC2D to it. Up shouldn't change the X at all. It should change the Y by some amount. I'm just going to pick negative two here for a second. We'll actually wind up changing that. Down, left, right. The down should move positive. The left should move minus two and x. The right should move two and x, and both of those should move zero. So now if I run this, and I press some keys, we're still not moving it becomes clear why we're not moving if I start typing other keys. Okay. Remember, there's this concept called focus. I could have multiple text boxes in here, but my keystrokes only go to one of them. Same thing goes with the canvas. Okay. My listeners, my handlers, are set up on the canvas, but the canvas isn't getting the keystrokes. The keystrokes are going to that text field that I created. And I created it exactly to illustrate this point. Um, how do we get around that? Well, if we didn't have the text field, it would almost be nope, one line up here. It would almost be significant or sufficient to say canvas.requestfocus. So this way we can make the canvas request the focus for us. And indeed, if we run this, that will be sufficient. Notice I can go buzzing around. I can do diagonals. Whoop, oh, but then I'm gone. OK, what happened? Well, the focus went back here. Okay, I lost the focus. Turns out there's another problem here. I didn't click on this to give it focus. By default, Scala FX likes to use the arrow keys for moving focus around. So every time I hit the up arrow and the canvas has focus, it goes up above. That actually causes us some problems. So we need to make a choice here. Uh, we could make it so these don't use the arrow keys. I could use, for example, W, A, S, and D instead. Uh, or, in this case, I only put the text field in there for kind of illustrative purposes. The easiest thing I can do is remove the text field. So I'm going to comment out that line. Now I have this request focus. It's still possible that weird things could happen, or if I had changed this to W, A, S, D. So in addition to requesting it down there, if I click on this, if I click on the canvas, it should probably also request focus. There's another handler that we can do on mouse entered, so that any time the mouse enters the area, I'd also like it to request focus. That kind of covers our bases so that it's we can definitely get focus back you'd still wind up running into problems if we have the text field and uh, and we're using the up, down, left, and right arrow keys because it just turns out that those arrow keys like to, the way they're set up, move you between things and moves the focus for you even when, when you weren't wanting to do it. Okay, so now if we run this, I should be able to move around and things work fairly well. Okay. By the way, if you ever write a GUI that's supposed to take keyboard input and you press the keys and nothing happens, think of this. This is probably your error. It's one of the most common things. Right now, I'm just moving two pixels every time the animation timer fires. Might remember, there's this argument being passed into here, and this is time. And that is because the animation timer doesn't always fire at regular intervals. It just happens every so often. By moving you two pixels every time, you could actually get non-uniform motion, especially if the computer or this program were doing a whole lot of other stuff. Instead, what we should do is we should make it how far you move is dependent upon how much time has elapsed since the last time through. 
in order to do that, I need to have a var for the last time that we came through. Time is a long, so this will need to be a long. And assuming that the last time is not equal to zero, I want to go through and do my movements. And no matter what, I want to set last time equal to time after I'm done with this. Now, how far do I move? Well, I could probably de decide upon something. So how about we say, I'm gonna make a variable called box speed, and I'm gonna make it so that the box moves at 20 pixels per second. So inside of here, I can calculate how many seconds it's been. I'll call that interval. The interval is equal to the current time minus the last time, and then I'm going to divide that by 1e9, because it turns out these times are measured in nanoseconds. So there's a billion nanoseconds in a second, so I have to divide that out, and that gives me an interval measured in seconds. So the amount that I want to move is that interval times the box speed. And I will just replace all of my twos here with that. And now, even if we're under heavy load or whatnot, this should behave appropriately. So I can move around. I still have my diagonal motion. 20 almost seems a bit slow. I might want to speed that up some. Maybe we should make it so that we move 40 pixels per second. I might also want to give my uh, chasers a different speed. How about I make them move 20? So I can move twice as fast as they do. And then we need to add into here the logic to make it so that those chasers move. And we want them to move toward the player. Okay, so how are we going to do that? I'll do this after the motion of the player. Well, I need to run through all of the chasers and do this. So I'm going to say for chaser position P in chasers. Do a little pattern matching there. Uh, actually, no, let's go ahead. Chasers is a list. Chasers equals chasers.map. And then we'll use C for a chaser. C rocket. And this needs to give us back a chaser in the end. And that chaser is going to have a different location than the current one and it's going to be different by an amount that moves us towards the player. So towards the player would be the box location, and then I want to subtract off from that. Let's see, if I subtract off the C, oops, the chaser's position from this, this is going so if the box has a larger location, this is going to be positive. Yeah, so this goes from the chaser to the box. Uh, but it turns out that that is going to get be large if you're far away and small if you're, if you're not. So I want to divide that by the magnitude of that same thing. How about we just do this? Val uh, separation. And then... I can make it so that my movement, the movement is going to be separation divided by sep dot magnitude, which will hopefully never get quite to zero, um, and then times the amount that we're supposed to move. So this process here is division is basically it's often referred to as normalization. It's making it a unit vector. So then times interval. Oh. Uh, times the chaser speed. So the bigger the chaser's speed, or the bigger the interval, the more that we will move. And we're going to return a new chaser with a position that is the old chaser's position plus the amount that we just calculated that they are going to move. Okay, let's see if that works. So if I click here, sure enough, that chaser is moving towards me. I can click a bunch more times. 
and they all start heading towards the player. The player is able to move faster than they are. What does not happen right now is, in fact, if I allowed them to catch me, who knows, they might all start disappearing if they actually did the division by zero. What's not happening is they're not going away. So after they have moved, I might actually want to then filter these so that I only keep the chasers that are a certain distance away from the box. So I want to calculate the distance between the two, which would just be the magnitude of the separation. So once again, I have a something like this, except now I don't have to do a lot more math with it, dot magnitude. Let's say I drew both of these at 10 pixels. So let's say if you get within 10 pixels, uh, then you will go away. So I only want to keep you if that is greater than 10. Okay, so this will run through all the chasers, move them, and then filter them based upon how close they are to the player. We can run this again. We can bring the player out, and I can create some chasers who as soon as they get close to the player disappear. Okay, so that produces a nice little program that uses animation, shows interactivity, remember to request focus when you want to use the mouse, remember that if you want to be able to move diagonally and have, have more control over your movement, in fact this really is what you should do, you really should change these values inside of, uh, you know, have some boolean values that tell you whether the keys are up or down, and only move stuff around inside of the animation timer. <clears throat> that gives you full control to set the speed that they're moving and to potentially deal with different frame rates and how fast the uh, animation timer is clicking. You also don't have to worry about keyboard refresh rates, which our previous example actually did when we, when we took the inputs here. I can actually demonstrate this. If that was, if I, hold this down, you can see I go down and it pauses and then it moves faster. Okay, so there's this keyboard refresh rate that we don't really have control over. You might notice that when we run this one, that doesn't happen. I press down and I hold it, the motion is smooth the entire time. So this is just a better way for us to do the animations and to, to move things around inside of a program.